This program is a presentation of UCTV for educational and non-commercial use only. I'm honored to be here, and um, I would say the following, that, um, you know, people are so used to hearing bad news about the Middle East that there's this kind of a dissonance almost. I mean, they, you feel like they can't even hear good news. Uh, it ruins their day. So I apologize in advance if we we're going to ruin anyone's day. Uh, but amid all the pessimism, what we're seeing out of Washington and the Middle East is, 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 is some glimmers of light, and that we want to build upon this um, it, in the future. Let me just say, before talking about what does the U.S. do policy-wise, what is the context um, together uh, as we look at the situation? What is, what is the context on the ground? And uh, I'm not here to tell you that everything is, is, is hunky-dory, everything is, is easy, and uh, all that's missing is, is a signature of uh, a peace treaty to end this conflict. The differences are genuine. But there, what we're seeing in the last couple years is some cooperation that we haven't seen in the past. And uh, I'd like to, to look a little bit at where these rays of light are coming from. I think they're coming from largely uh, the fact what happened in Gaza uh, in 2007 uh, was a wake-up call to everybody that if, if Hamas took over Gaza, uh, it could be coming to a theater near you in the West Bank. And therefore, what has to happen is the Palestinian Authority and Israel have to find ways to work together. I think part of the, of the gift, and, and, and this conflict hasn't had many gifts, it's, it's been cursed in many ways, but one of the gifts has been a, a new Palestinian prime minister named Salam Fayyad, who in my view is a visionary. He happens to have a PhD at the University of Texas in economics, 14 years at the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank, and uh, he's been a believer in, in focusing on uh, uh, raising Palestinian living standards and building institutions. And that has translated itself in a few ways. One is the security realm, uh, professionalizing the Palestinian security forces. In the 90s, uh, the Palestinian security forces were, where there were 13 different agencies, and Yasser Arafat liked keeping all of the leaders off balance because he felt that somehow reinforced his own leadership. There was a couple strong men um, on the ground in the West Bank and Gaza, Jabril Rajoub, Mohammed Dahlan. What we're seeing now is a professionalization of the Palestinian security force. That's being led by a three-star U.S. general named uh, Keith Dayton, who is also a remarkable individual and is devoted to it. He was, uh, you know, he's extended his term by another two years, um, and uh, he's really devoted, and he talks to all sides. Uh, and I think that's been a big help. Just to put this graphically, in 2002, 410 Israelis were killed in attacks coming from the West Bank. In 2009, so far, the number of Israelis killed is one. Of course, every person is a world in and of itself, but uh, that tells you something about the security environment. Um, I could tell you, talking to Israeli generals and Palestinian security, uh, two years ago, they weren't even talking to each other. Uh, now, when I talk to them, they say, we have hundreds of meetings. Um, there's been a real change, and the change is a belief that, um, that, that people are talking to each other on the level. Um, we have at our institute a deputy head of the Shin Bet, the Israel Security Services, um, and some of his colleagues, and we asked them, what's changed? They go, they've stopped lying to us. Uh, we can work with them. You say, what about the revolving door? Didn't Yasser Arafat used to, you know, it takes somebody from Hamas and then let them go a day later when nobody was looking. They go, there's no revolving door. These Palestinians are the real thing. Now, these are not people that are easy to win over um, on either side, 
but I think they see that there's, um, there's a need um, to work together. And that need to work together is, is playing itself out, not just in the security realms, but let me give you a couple other incident, uh, examples. In the economic sphere, uh, the IMF is saying that the West Bank is growing at a rate of 7%. Um, and uh, that's at a time of a global recession. I was in Ramallah this summer. I thought the national bird was the, uh, was the crane because uh, there's a lot of construction going on. Uh, and what's also happening is that the chaos that existed in the Palestinian cities has suddenly has, uh, has turned in a different direction. Uh, it, there's now quiet. The Palestinian security services are, as, as they've gotten control of the cities, um, economic uh, uh, atmosphere of, of, of progress, uh, shopping malls and things like that are happening. I don't mean to suggest that everything is hunky-dory, uh, there's no problems, but, uh, but there are some glimmers here that did not exist. I think Israel took the number of uh, checkpoints from 45 to 12 uh, to try to facilitate this economic activity. And, and I think we're seeing the beginnings here of, of something new. That, and I think that's important. I think it's playing itself out also. Uh, by the way, the Palestinian polling data, they asked Palestinians, do you feel more secure personally? Uh, a few years ago, the number was 25%. And now the number is up to 58%. Uh, so I think that perception of an improvement is, is starting to, uh, to make its way. And um, you're seeing this also play itself out, uh, it seems to me, in, um, in an area that is not focused on a lot. And that is in, 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 uh, in the area that struck me was an area of religion. That has often been a, a, a flashpoint and, and could still be because the issue of Jerusalem is not being solved tomorrow morning. But I sat with the Palestinian minister of religion. Um, I asked him, you know, uh, how he saw things. He said, look, we've got 1,800 mosques in the West Bank. Uh, where do the suicide bombers come from? You know, that, it's from there. They get, uh, you know, they get in, incited uh, by sermons they hear. So we've got a new program uh, to, to find out who are these preachers, these imams, that are inciting people. And uh, if they keep doing it, we've moved them out. One Palestinian head of security said, we've moved out about 200 imams. Um, this is a change, and it's not happening because a Jewish organization demanded it or America demanded it. It's happening because they have a sense of self-interest. Uh, this guy even went further and said, well, we can't stop at the mosque. We have to go to the teacher seminaries. What's the curriculum being taught to the imams? Uh, and to me... This gives me a sense of hope. I think if people do things for reason of self-interest, and my belief it's the most sustainable reason to believe it will continue over time. So I think whether it's security cooperation, you know, economic openings, if it's um, the third area would be, you know, like I said, in this issue of religion. The fourth area, and this gets back to Fayyad himself, is governance. Um, you have a Palestinian... Uh, who Prime Minister, who believes that he will be judge on living standards and building institutions from the bottom up. Now, th that is not considered sexy in, in international relations, state building. It's arduous work. I think Yasser Arafat believed that was not in his job description. First, give me the state, then I'll think about it. But I think you've got a Palestinian Prime Minister who's, my understanding, told uh, George Bush, look, look at the Zionists, look how they did it. The, the, Israel was from the Balfour Declaration until the state being formed. They used that 31 years to build hospitals, to build schools, to build universities, to build financial institutions, security institutions. Um, and I think in, in many ways, he's taking a, a page out of that playbook of building institutions. And we're seeing the public respond. Uh, again, looking at Khalil Shakaki's polls out of Ramallah, who traces this, um, when routinely, people on the Palestinian side used to say that their own Palestinian authority was corrupt. Now we've seen that, that self-perception be sliced by a full third in a relatively short period of time. So to me, when I add up all of these things, security, economics, 
um, a little movement on the religion, the sense of governance, I see some hope that I didn't see. I also see um, that this sense of uh, self-interest is, and this convergence between Israel and the Palestinian Authority is because this fear of Hamas asserting itself. Israel fears, sees Hamas as a terror organization. The Palestinian Authority sees Hamas as wanting to take them back to the 12th century. So whatever your perception is, um, they both agree that Hamas is not uh, in favor of coexistence. And so therefore, there's some, there's some real common interest here. And a belief that institution building is going gonna, is gonna to be um, is the way forward. Now, um, what about on the Israeli side? And what does this all mean for the United States? Where I think the glimmer is there is that I covered uh, Bibi Netanyahu as a journalist in the 90s. And I think what we're seeing now is uh, BB 2.0, as I would call it. I know we're not far from the Silicon Valley. But um, the, um, it would seem to me that, you know, even he's talking now about two, a two-state solution. He gave a speech to the National Defense College, which is I've always seen as a bellwether speech. When I wrote a book on the Oslo Accord and Israel's march to Oslo in 1993, uh, Rabin used that forum to kind of uh, signal, you know, a new direction. And he spoke at that forum, Netanyahu, and he said, look, in our part of the world, uh, we're going to be judged by what do we do as Israel to help moderates in the Palestinian Authority as they have to grapple with their more radical alternative. So I think that there's been some changes there. I think the Israeli public generally would like to see a two-state solution. Um, and uh, that is an important change, just as you've seen this Palestinian change towards greater sense of self-awareness, uh, uh, towards greater responsibility. Um, these are important developments. You can't measure these things by minutes, but there's been some important moves on the ground. Now, what does that all mean for the United States? I think, uh, taken together, this provides an opening. President Obama gives a hope of new energy, a fresh focus on this issue. He named an envoy literally on the second day of his administration, and uh, he has prioritized this issue. Now, he personally has a lot on his plate. I don't think he's personally uh, putting a lot of time into it. He's setting the general direction and having uh, George Mitchell, his envoy, um, work on this issue. Dennis Ross, my co-author of this book that I'll be signing tonight, uh, he's now at the White House, too, and I think he's really helped um, the administration navigate the minefields on this question. But I think there's a chance here. Now, some of you might know I like uh, sports analogies, so I'd like to give a sports analogy um, about what can the United States do. I think we have to be careful if, if we're on a football field and we want to go 100 yards down the field that we don't throw what, what is called the Hail Mary in football, which is you just throw the ball as far as you can, hoping somebody's going to catch it. Um, the odds are you throw an interception, or uh, at least you don't complete the pass. I think we're better off with what I would call a screen pass in the Middle East, a shorter pass, but taking the ball 70 yards down the field. Um, why do I think that? Um, I, because I think if it's all or nothing in the Middle East, it's nothing. Uh, any one detail or contentious point could unravel um, the entire enterprise. And you have people who are jaded, uh, they've heard speeches before, they don't believe speeches. And I think as Americans, we can't fail. Uh, we tried at Camp David, uh, but we cannot afford to fail again. So I think we've got to identify what are the issues that are, are ripe for resolution and what are those that take more leadership on both sides to condition the societal landscape for resolution. And it seems to me the issues of Jerusalem and refugees are issues that are crucial but relate to the self-definition of the parties and they've not prepared their peoples for compromise. The issue of security is going to have to be phased in very carefully. Israel feels that it got out of Gaza. I was asked by Condoleezza Rice what I, how I saw things on the eve of the Annapolis Conference of uh, 2007. I said the Israelis feel that they, uh, you know, they read the, the book in Gaza. They don't want to see the movie in the West Bank. 
They got out of Gaza, but they got thousands of missiles. So Israel has got to do this very carefully, uh, but in a way that it's not land for vulnerability, but land for peace. What is ripe for resolution? I think, ironically, it's the issue of land, which might surprise some of you, because some of you may feel land is uh, what this conflict is about. I never felt it was about land. I felt it's about a mutual recognition uh, of the other. But it seems to me that on the issue of land, the differences are actually narrow. Uh, Israeli Prime Minister Olmert and uh, Palestinian uh, President Abbas were only four percentage points apart uh, at the end of their effort uh, at the start of 2009 to, to try to define that end on the, on the land issue. They both agreed that uh, if Israel would take um, a, a couple percentage points, whatever it is, that Israel would give in return what we call a land swap, offsetting land within the 1967 boundaries. What I've spent um, a, a lot of time at the Washington Institute trying to understand where does demography meet geography in this conflict. And what I found out is something that I felt was kind of stunning. Uh, and, and I was very pleased that Joe Klein uh, in, in the Time magazine this week wrote a column about it. And um, it was very gracious to me. But um, he, it's called How Barack Obama Could Earn the Nobel Peace Prize. And what Klein you know, points out, I mean, what I said to him is that what people don't realize is that 80% of the settlers live in less than 5% of the land, largely adjacent to the pre-1967 boundaries. Um, if there would be a way to solve the issue of the borders of the two-state solution first, I think this would be a big win for both sides. Palestinian moderates could say, we got what Anwar Sadat got. We got 100% of the land of the West Bank uh, with land swaps. And Israel could say, we got 80% of the settlers um, in, in, this, in this area, and we gave offsetting land swaps. And what the United States could say is, we have solved the settlements issue, which has been a friction point in, uh, for the United States over the last 40 years. And uh, because now there's not a, uh, there'll be a border. If the settlements are within the line, they're Israel, not occupied West Bank. And if they're outside the line, they go. Uh, but 80% of the people, if you can make them part of the solution, uh, I think it's important, instead of being part of the problem, but let each side have a sense of dignity that they achieved a major objective. And let the moderates on the Palestinian side believe that they got something big. It wasn't the kidnapping of Israeli soldiers. It wasn't the firing of rockets. It wasn't the deployment of suicide bombers in Israeli cities and buses and discotheques. It was the negotiators. Because if the, these moderates like Abbas and Fayyad are discredited, in my view, the people who pick up the pieces are not the Hadassah women of Brooklyn. It's Hamas. And that's the real world. And it seems to me if you could find a solution that gives everyone their primary objective, you haven't solved the problem. We're still, we might only be 30 yards out from a touchdown. But we'll have marched 70 yards down the field. We'll be in a much better place than we are now on our own goal line. And I think Barack Obama and his administration are, are qualified and, and motivated uh, and focused to try to help move the ball in that direction. Don't try to solve it all at once uh, because you've got to condition the landscape on some of these other issues. And if all these issues get linked to each other, we're sure to fail again. But we can demonstrate major strides and demonstrate that diplomacy is vindicated and that the, the rejectionists do not necessarily reflect the future, uh, but the past. And that requires moderates to come together. That's why I'm here with Rachel Amari tonight, and that's why I hope that together we could, we could focus on that future, again, more light and less heat for the Middle East. Believe me, they need it. Thank you all very much. I think the main message that David and I are bringing here is the fact that you can have a Palestinian and an Israeli, both coming from the heart of the establishment, not from the peace camp, not from the left, not from the uh, traditional, normal, usual suspects, but from the heart of the establishment, who can stand together and actually give 
the same message. There are differences in uh, details and opinions, but I believe what, we, what this event stands for is the ray of hope that I see happening throughout the Middle East and in Washington and in the state, uh, in this country uh, by and large. You have a sense of the two-state solution, the paradigm of a two-state solution, becoming the mainstream. Becoming the mainstream in Israel, where you have someone like Bibi Netanyahu, the current prime minister, who is identified very much with the right wing, coming and actually endorsing a two-state approach. And before him, uh, Ariel Sharon did the same. You have it, obviously, on the Palestinian side. You have it in Washington, whether it's the administration, whether it's Congress, whether it's the various Jewish and Palestinian groups and Arab groups that are in this country. We see a shift of paradigm, and you see a consensus. And this gives me hope. The question is, we have this shift of paradigm. We have this consensus. What is the role of the U.S. in all of this? What should the U.S. do? What can the U.S. do? Can the U.S. bring uh, <coughs> peace to the region? This is the topic of this uh, talk. And really, when I look at the question that we were asked in the title of this presentation, I will unpack it into four questions. First question is, do the sides actually need someone to bring them together, to go to peace? Do we need a third party in the, uh, in the conflict? Can America be this third party? Is America qualified to be this uh, party that will bring them together? If so, what's the best way of doing it? And finally, a more basic question, why should the U.S. do this? Why should the U.S. bother with this when there are so many other conflicts and so many other issues and priorities that are uh, coming across? I'm going to try to answer each of these questions uh, to some extent. Do we need a third party? Absolutely. Certainly. The final resolution of this conflict will have to be done by the two parties, the Palestinians and the Israelis. No one else can do it for them. It entails very deep existential issues that they have to come to terms with and no one else can impose a solution on them. However, Palestinians and Israelis, from my experience working with both sides very closely, they, and they act in some ways like traumatized children who actually always relive their trauma and are too afraid to try something else. They need adult supervision. This adult supervision has to come from a third party that is detached, that can see, if you wish, the forest for the trees. The Palestinians and Israelis, in my view, are hostages to two things. They're hostages to their political systems. Those of you who've done any political work or study of the Palestinian and Israeli domestic political systems will find out that these are highly dysfunctional and unstable political systems. No Israeli prime minister, I think, for the last 20, 30 years have served full term. Israeli governments uh, change very quickly. On the Palestinian side, it's a mosaic of different uh, organizations that have not yet agreed even on the basic rules of the game of the, political, uh, of the political system, let alone how they interact within it. So often, as the negotiators come to the negotiations, as diplomats come to do these kind of things, they often have one eye on the negotiations, one eye on how am I going to manage my constituency and my politics back home. You would need a party that is free from these considerations to bring them and to keep them focused on the issues uh, in place. But also, the Palestinians and the Israelis have had a very bloody and very painful history together. And they find it very hard often to uh, let go of this history. I mean, I remember we wasted hours and days in Camp David and before that and after that discussing whose fault it is and who started it. And it's your fault, no, it's your fault. It's very hard for people who are within the conflict to detach and look at it in an objective manner. And you often need someone in the room to come and say, Look, guys, what are you trying to do? We're trying to reach a deal here, not to relive uh, old uh, animosities. And only a third party can do it. Both sides are afraid of the unknown, even though the conflict is very painful. And the daily reality for both Palestinians and Israelis are very painful. But it's a known reality. It's predictable. You can manage it. What we're asking, what the peace deal will do, will, will plunge us all into a new reality, into a new unknown phase of our uh, national uh, lives. And there need to be assurances, and we need trusted parties to come and hold the two sides and give them enough assurance that things will move forward and things will be stable and the future is not quite as bad as they might fear it is. So we need a third party. That, from my perspective, is, uh, is a given. The Palestinians and Israelis cannot do it alone. The question is, then, if we accept this, can the U.S. be this party? Or should it be someone else? 
to be another country. I think there are obvious reasons why the U.S. should be the uh, party, and I would even say the only party that can play this uh, mediation and this uh, convening role. There are obvious reasons for that, obvious IR reasons, international relations reasons. U.S. is a superpower. It has resources within its disposal which are not available to any other country, whether financial, whether diplomatic, whether political. And not only does it have its own resources to marshal, but the U.S. is capable of marshalling other countries and other nations' resources. When the U.S. leads, others follow. We've seen it often, for example, in terms of financial aid to the Palestinian Authority. Many countries in the Arab world and the Gulf states are often uh, reluctant to give money and to uh, fulfill their obligations, financial obligations. Once the Congress uh, allocates a certain amount of money to the PA, even if it's a small amount, the other Arab countries, the Arab countries will find themselves obliged to pay. So the U.S. can marshal other countries' resources. And I've talked about financial, but there are many other resources, diplomatic, security, and other resources. These are the obvious reasons, but there's, I believe, a more basic and a more fundamental reason why the U.S. is the only country that can play that role. Often when I do talks, public speaking, the first question that I get asked is, is the U.S. an honest broker? My answer is, absolutely not. But that's not the question. That's not the right question. I don't need an honest broker. I need an effective broker. And the U.S. is the only effective broker because, ironically, it is not an honest broker. The depth of relations between U.S. and Israel, the depth and breadth of these relationships, be it cultural, be it religious, be it uh, worldview, be it military, be it financial, economic, you name it. The depth of these relations means that, Israel, that the United States is the only country that Israel can trust to move forward in the process. The special relationship gives Israel assurances as it moves into a very uncertain phase in its uh, history and in its life. And for the Palestinians in the Arab world, there's a very clear knowledge that the Americans bring the real concrete issues on the table. So for me, the U.S. is really, for this reason, for the obvious reasons, but for the more intangible reasons, is the only player that can uh, bring the sides together. Okay, if we accept this, the next question becomes, how do we do it? And I can start by telling you how not to do it. The U.S. should lead, but it should not monopolize. I think one of the biggest mistakes of the Bush administration was shutting the other stakeholders from the process. The Palestinian-Israeli conflict is a conflict that touches, I think, every country in the Middle East, but also touches many other players in the international community. Everyone needs a sense of buy-in, and everyone brings very distinct resources into this uh, conflict. The Arabs bring, to the Palestinian side, they bring, uh, a sense of strategic depth, a sense of political support. To Israel, they bring a sense of needed normalization in the region. The Europeans bring knowledge, expertise, and financial resources. None of those players can lead the process, but they all have to be utilized. The U.S. should lead, but should not uh, monopolize. The U.S. should approach this uh, issue on two fronts, and I think David alluded to these fronts. The peace process is actually two processes. One is the macro process that we all hear about. How do you resolve Jerusalem and territory and refugees and all of these attractive, uh, big uh, existential issues? That is a track that needs to continue, but needs to be managed very, very carefully. I think the U.S.'s role in dealing with these issues has to be calibrated to bring the sides together, to help them overcome their domestic political constraints and their uh, squeamishness about the issue and bring them to the room, bring them to the table, make sure they're staying in the table, impose a code of conduct of how do you uh, approach the negotiations in the room and outside the room. I think one of the most damaging things that the Palestinians and Israelis did when I was a negotiator in the 90s, we would have a good meeting and then to cater to our own publics, the Palestinians and Israelis, we'll go out and start slamming the other side and start sending negative messaging. I think the U.S., as a, uh, the responsible adult in this uh, process, has to come in and impose a clear code of conduct to make sure that the general atmospherics in the region match the progress that is made uh, in the room. And even if there's no progress in the room, the public has to be, the hope has to be kept alive. But beyond that, I don't think the U.S. should get uh, too involved in the substance of the issues. As I said earlier, 
these are big existential issues that the parties have to reach a conclusion by themselves. If any side feels that the solution has been imposed on it, the solution will not stick. They might agree to it short term because they don't want to anger the president, but at the end of the day, if there's no buy-in, if there's no sense of ownership, the process will not move forward. It doesn't mean that there wouldn't come a time that uh, the U.S. has to put ideas on the table, but you do that at a time when you know that their parties are ready for the uh, deal and they just need that last final push. You don't do it too early, otherwise it will explode in your face, and we've seen it in the past. We saw it in Camp David and other places. But that's one track. What's happening uh, in the peace process? And my uh, assessment is that this is something that's going to take time. This is a process that has to uh, run its own course. The good news is I think we're going to start the process very soon. The reports that we're hearing from Washington this week, the Palestinians and Israelis have been there, have been encouraging, but I think it's going to take time to finalize it. As that happens, something else goes on. Life goes on in the West Bank, in Gaza, in Israel. Life goes on. And the U.S. has a very important role in ensuring that things on the ground continue to be positive, continue to grow, and to continue to send, to create a sense of progress among the public. I think one of the biggest mistakes when I was a negotiator, we were making progress on, uh, in our closed meetings. Your average person on the street did not feel that. Luckily, in my view, and uh, David did allude to that very eloquently, so I'm not going to dwell on it, the Palestinians have decided to start, for their own sake, a process of state building and imposing security on the ground. And the U.S. can be very helpful. In terms of security, the U.S. has already been very helpful with uh, General Dayton and the efforts that they're making to do that. And the Palestinians are doing security not only for the peace process. And that's, no fee, uh, you know, that's not a small reason to do it. I think it's important to do it for the peace process, but they're doing it for their own selves because you cannot have a state. Those of you who have studied sociology or international relations or politics know that the basic, most basic concept of statehood is monopoly over violence. And as long as you have a state with militias, it's not a state. It's at best a weak, dysfunctional government. The Palestinians are starting that process, and I think the U.S. should continue helping with them. But the other progress is what uh, David mentioned, the issue of uh, institution building. Besides the fact that it's important and it's good for delivering uh, services and for a responsive government, I think it is providing a new model and vision for Palestinian politics. Unfortunately, many Palestinian politicians uh, like to, excuse my term, like to whine sit there and whine and say, oh, the occupation did this and the Americans did that and whatever, never taking responsibility. I think you have a prime minister now who has taken responsibility, who said, despite of the occupation, despite of everything, I am going to build my institutions, my state for my people. I think that's a worthy goal, and I think the U.S. should continue to deal with this, not only as a development issue worthy of some money here and there, but as a political project to be adopted and to be supported. Now, this is what the U.S. should do. This is how they should do it. The question is, why should the U.S. do it? Why bother? And my view is the U.S. should not do it because the U.S. likes Palestinians or Israelis or feels sorry for them or sympathy or what have you. The best motivator is self-interest. And I think President Obama has put it, put it best when he defined resolving the issue as an issue that goes to the heart of the American national security interest. And that plays out in many ways. It plays out with the conflict itself. It's destabilizing. A couple of weeks ago, we came very close to a showdown and, and a confrontation in Jerusalem. If that were to happen, Jordan would have been dragged in. The streets in uh, Cairo would have been filled with demonstrations. It would have destabilized the whole region. It gives the U.S. regional leverage. The sense that the U.S. is not engaged in this has uh, lost it a lot of credibility and political credit and diplomatic credit in the region. As the Iraq study group, that was uh, done under the last year, headed by uh, <clears throat> two distinguished by Baker and Hamilton. It said that you need this to create the right kind of envelope, regional envelope, to move forward with other issues in the region, like Iraq, like democratization, like some of these issues. It doesn't mean that once you resolve the Palestinian-Israeli issue, suddenly all of the warring parties will drop their guns and you know, start singing Kumbaya together. It's not going to happen, but it will remove one strand from this complicated region and to make the resolution of the stabilization of the region more uh, easier. And finally, you remove a very important ammunition from extremist uh, countries and groups. Every time that Ahmadinejad wants to mobilize the street, he picks up the Palestinian flags, starts waving it and says Al-Quds, Al-Quds, and people start uh, mobilizing. 
Bin Laden and Zawahiri, every time they want to get some uh, credit, you have a tape sent to Al Jazeera talking about Jerusalem and uh, Palestine and what have you. You remove this piece of ammunition from the enemies of the United States and enemies of moderation in that region. Finally, as I close, I mean, this was my view, my policy view on the things, but I want to leave with a slightly less heavy uh, message. Today, David and I had a talk, had a lunch this afternoon, and it was one of the most moving events that I've done for a while, and it gave me a lot of hope. This lunch was with a group of uh, student activists from various Jewish, Muslim, and Arab uh, groups, and very, very mainstream, very centrist groups. The lunch was civil, the lunch was engaged, people were talking, people did not agree, but I felt that there was a sense of curiosity, and this, to me, countered a trend that I see on campuses, in our communities, a trend of combative uh, discourse, a trend of divisive and polarizing discourse. I must say, I left today with a sense of hope. I left today feeling that if we see this on campuses, we see it in Washington, we see it in the region, then maybe we have a chance this time. Thank you again. Thank you very much for this. in terms of say that Hamas has lost its political capital and maybe its political hold in Gaza, what happens when, assuming that all the parties do come to the table and they do have a peace accord, what happens if there's suicide attacks in Israel, in Jerusalem, at a critical moment? I mean, I think that's where Hamas has shown that they are able to derail the peace process. How is it going to be different this time? I, w I would argue the following, and I, you know, I was there in the 90s when, you know, you had these timed suicide bombings to, to wreck everything. And what you really saw was the following. The issue was less about the bomber, but how Yasser Arafat dealt with Hamas. Uh, I think it was Rabin that came up with the question of, you won't always have 100% results, but you need 100% effort. And if the Israeli security establishment at the time, believe Yasser Arafat, uh, with one exception in, in 1996, but was putting in 5% effort, that's where these attacks, apart from being horrific and exacting a horrific uh, uh, human toll, uh, where these attacks really ha did lasting damage is that it undermined any sense of confidence uh, between Israel and the Palestinian Authority that they were the real deal in, in combating terrorism. And, and in a certain way, well, you know, I accept, you know, I, Rafe and I agree that you know, as you make progress, it's very possible that your point is going to happen, that you'll see more attacks. But to me, again, the issue will be less than the attacks, but how does the authority deal with it? And I think what, what, what like blows me away, and I mean, I've been at this, and Ray's been at this for a while, and it's very hard to blow us away, but I think what really excites me is that, that you don't see the finger pointing that we've seen uh, almost, you know, for, for 20 years, and certainly since Madrid, and certainly since Oslo, that has been a permanent fixture, has been finger pointing, and uh, revolving door. And, you know, Israel was correct, by the way, in, in, in saying that Yasser Arafat had a revolving door. But the fact that nobody is charging revolving door today, that, that they believe that there's a good faith effort on the Palestinian Authority's part to combat terrorism and, uh, and deal with it that way, to me, gives me hope that there, any ability of any attack, again, as horrific uh, on a human level as it is, to do lasting political damage could be limited if the defense establishments believe that there is this 100% effort. Because it was the lack of the 100% effort, more than the lack of the 100% results, in my view, in the 90s, that undermined confidence. And the belief in 100% effort suggests to me that um, that they're much better positioned with sturdier institutions to weather any of these storms. I mean, there are technical security things that you can do about that. Revive security cooperation and intelligence uh, cooperation, which is developing right now. I would take a couple of uh, pages from the South African uh, experience. Two interesting things in South Africa that I think are very applicable, and not many things from South Africa are applicable to our conflict, but these two are. One is, you, as, as the peace process was going on, 
they established something that they called an insulated channel to deal specifically with these kind of things, where no matter how things got, how bad things got, you know that kernel X and kernel Y have a phone link and they will talk and they will uh, deal with this and they expect uh, manage expectations. That's one. But another one that goes a bit beyond that goes to the nature of leadership and the nature of leaders and the need for courageous leadership. In South Africa, for those of you who have followed the conflict, and I haven't, but there was a time when a very senior, close to the peace deal, a very senior member of the uh, ANC was assassinated by right-wing uh, elements, specifically to derail the peace process. What did Mandela do? He didn't come out and uh, denounce all the uh, whites and all the Boers and all of that, no. He sent all of his ministers and all of his top lieutenants and all of his people to the street, to the flash points, to the uh, friction points, to make sure that they de-escalate. He appeared on TV and called on the public not to respond. I think this requires a lot of leadership, and that's where, again, I go back to the theme of this presentation. It's very important to have someone with wisdom and vision from the American side there assisting the sides when the emotions are very high, when these things inevitably, unfortunately, probably will happen. Mr. Omari, you said that one of the roles for the U.S. during the negotiation process is to ensure that progress takes place on the ground mm -hmm. while the parties are negotiating. Mm -hmm. And my question to both of you would be, what would that progress look like and what kind of action would the U.S. be required to take? The progress would look like there are two levels, or actually three levels, I would say. One is security. Progress has already been made in ensuring security that has to continue, that has to be expanded, and has to be deepened. And that's for security officials and experts to uh, deal with. As I said, this is important for Palestinian state building, for public sentiment, and for peace process purposes. But there are two other um, fronts that we have to see progress on. One is economy. And that's an issue that has to be a trilateral uh, Palestinian-Israeli-American uh, effort. One of the main reasons, if not the main reason, for the uh, economic decline in the West Bank is uh, constraints on access and movement the ability to move within the uh, Palestinian territories, and that's very much linked to the security situation. At the end of the day, many of the checkpoints and, uh, are there for security reasons. The more that security progresses, we have to see that sec progress in security being translated into more access and movement that will translate into economic development. This is a trilateral process that has to be there, and it has to be managed by the uh, Americans for one simple reason. Palestinians and Israelis tend to, uh, how shall I say it? play these things and play games often and not give credit where credit is due. And I think a third party is good to put the, be there and put, give credit where credit is due. So this is the second uh, front. The third front, which in my view is almost a purely Palestinian effort that needs American uh, support, is institution building. Building, has, this has nothing to do with Israel. I'm not talking about institutions that uh, interact with Israel. I'm talking about Ministry of Education and departments of health and what have you. This is something that uh, if there is the right kind of Palestinian political will to move that, and I believe there is, the U.S. can come in on many levels, on the level of uh, funding and financing this kind of thing, but more importantly, on the level of qualitative uh, advice. If you've been to the region, if you've been to the Palestinian uh, authorities and Palestinian areas, the problem is not the lack of clinics, for example. It's the quality of healthcare, And this is things where U.S. expertise and U.S. skills and the U.S.'s ability to bring in other countries. For example, look at the, uh, how shall I say, the agriculture sector. Saudi Arabia has a great progress in the agriculture se uh, sector. I would love the Americans to come, the US to come and say, okay, I want you Saudis and the Palestinians to come and work on this one. So this issue of marshalling the various resources, bringing buy-in from the various players, and working on the security, economic, and state building uh, front is what I would like to see it move. I would just say on the you know, state building, to pick up on Wraith's last point, I think, you know, other countries have, whether it's, it could be agriculture, it could be commerce, it could be health, it could be education. You know, every country has come with certain, ex it could be water. Every country brings a certain expertise. Fayad has put forward a challenge for state building. It would be great if countries would come forward and say, here, on this issue, I could be of help. Uh, we could be of help here or there. Um, that's, that's one level of expertise that I think is important. Um, I mentioned the political negotiations. I don't want to belabor that point about the, the borders. I would like to see the Arab states, which we really haven't talked enough about um, this evening, playing a more of a constructive role. Yes, they have an Arab initiative, uh, in my view, which is better than what was, uh, which, you know, in the past they hadn't really said anything, what they would do if there was peace. But frankly, I think the uh, Arab initiative is very backloaded. 
It's basically Israel, you do it all. You get out of the West Bank. You get out of East Jerusalem. You get off the Golan Heights. And then send us a letter, and we'll send you an embassy. Uh, you know, that's kind of the end of the rainbow. Um, if you want to make an impact on, in, in, the, in the societies, uh, it can't be backloaded. Just, it can't be front-loaded either, because they'll suspect that Israel uh, you know, will, will kind of take the goodies and, and, and not deliver. I think it has to be parallel. For every step Israel takes towards the Palestinians, the Arab states will take a step towards Israel in integrating it into the Middle East. I think that's important. And there's another element, and Wraith has mentioned this, and that's the issue of public messaging. And that may sound to you very banal, like what difference does it make what these leaders tell their publics? But it makes a huge difference. What we find out, Wraith and I, is that we end up knowing a lot of things in, in Washington that are not always known by the people who live on the ground. Because these leaders don't want to broadcast to their own people what the other side has done. Uh, because they feel they will be seen somehow as suckers, that they will give the other side credit, the other side will not credit them, and it will be somehow asymmetrical that way. But therefore, there's a need to synchronize that public messaging. Because ultimately, what you need are core constituencies in both societies. We're trying to rebuild the center in these societies. These were the, the center of these societies were key in the 90s in, in prodding these uh, uh, leaders forward for peace. You've got to rebuild the center in each society. And if there's some acknowledgement of what the other side has done, now sometimes it's very sensitive. It could be in the area of intelligence or security. You can't always broadcast that. But there's got to be a way that the people understand there's progress. Because the people in Santa Barbara don't know there's progress sometimes. You'd be surprised that there are people who are living there who don't know all these statistics. They don't know all the other side has done because their leaders don't always tell their, their people what, what the other side has done. They might feel it means more pressure upon them to produce more. So they don't advertise it. But there's a cost to that approach, which is that you don't build uh, constituencies for peace. And if we're here in Santa Barbara, we're here to build that constituency. You could have polarized, uh, there could be something inflammatory in the Middle East. And I think it's important that you recognize that there is this narrowing of the gaps and that people here manage their differences. Don't kind of resort to polarizing reactions and find a way to manage those differences to more tranquil times. I realize it's not easy, but people need to know that moderates are coming together on both sides. And if that could happen in the Middle East, that should be able to happen in Santa Barbara, California. I've been reading a lot about um, Iran trying to fight a proxy war with Israel, like by sort of supporting Hezbollah and Hamas, and I was just wondering what your views were on Iran's role in this whole conflict. Yeah, okay, I, I just happen to have uh, an anecdote, and Wraith was in the room, I believe, too. We had our annual conference in Virginia, and we had the uh, former vice president of Iran address us on Saturday in Virginia. He worked with Raf Sanjani, who was the president of Iran in the 80s. And, um, you know, he talked about if there would, you know, if Israel would bomb or America would bomb Iran, how this is something the Iranian people would never forget. And first of all, I think I want to be clear that I think if you could solve this issue politically uh, at the negotiating table, as, as this administration is trying to do, if you could reach an agreement and if it could be enforced, these are open questions, of course, and ifs, but it's preferable if you could achieve that. But I asked him, you know, in his, in his, in his remarks, he, he didn't mention the fact that Iran has supported Hezbollah with, with arms, uh, with, with finance, with, you know, assistance for 27 years, supports Islamic Jihad and Hamas, uh, blows up an Israeli embassy in Argentina, according to an Argentinian court. This isn't an Israeli allegation. And this is all after Israel has never attacked Iran once. Um, and to me, the, one of the most crucial pieces here is at a time where Israel and the Palestinian Authority are trying to solve their differences, these guys are fanning the flames. It would be like, you know, lighting matches in a barn uh, and trying to blow up the whole barn at a time that, you know, you need it is very fragile and you need Israelis and Palestinians to work together. And I don't understand why they're meddling in a conflict that has no relation to them. If the Israelis and Palestinians want to solve their differences, why should they care? You know, you don't want to help, fine. But don't hurt it. Don't blow it up. And I didn't get an answer from him. So 
it's very upsetting. I feel they've been a destabilizing force in this region. It's very upsetting. And uh, I think ironically, when it comes to Iran, the only thing where they've been uh, successful is they're bringing Israelis and Arab regimes together in worrying about the Iranian nuclear project. Uh, that, that has brought Israelis and Arabs together more than anything else. So um, I, I, I'm not that uh, excited about Iran's role. I could withhold my enthusiasm uh, for the way they've conducted themselves in the past. I am hopeful that the Bush administration and my co-author Dennis Ross is a key figure of the White House in this effort of engagement with Iran. It's designed to, you know, not just as a, as a way of dialogue. Dialogue is part of it, to give Iran a choice. And hopefully Iran will choose well to join the civilized community. But if it doesn't, then uh, I think these things could escalate. I hope that would be unfortunate. Uh, there is a hope that they will take uh, a lot of their uranium out of the country, and that could de-escalate things. So I'm hopeful that uh, a political solution will be found, but I am not confident that that will be the case, but I think America is making a good faith effort. I, mean, I, would, I would add that uh, Iran is basically seeking to be the regional hegemon. It's trying to be the superpower in the region. And it's not only uh, conducting a proxy war against Israel, but it's trying to destabilize many of the other regimes and uh, uh, governments in the region. In the immediate proximity in the Arab Gulf, uh, be it in Bahrain, be it in Saudi, be it in the Emirates, they're trying to play the domestic politics. In Iran, obviously, what they're doing uh, in terms of targeting the Sunni uh, players within uh, Iraq, but also targeting the United States presence there and the United States forces there. But even goes further up uh, afield. I mean, uh, recently some news item that very few people uh, picked on, the Moroccan government expelled the Iranian ambassador. The reason behind that is that they found within the Iranian, uh, in the diplomatic pouch, not only propaganda material uh, inciting for violence, but also some uh, intelligence and uh, basically weapon making uh, manuals within that. Iran is trying to destabilize the whole region. Instability in Iran, in the region, helps uh, Iran. And whether it's the bomb or not the bomb, the Iran, Iran is an issue that I believe has to be contained. And I agree with the Obama administration on this one. All the options have to be on the table. In diplomacy, you have a wide uh, toolbox that uh, you have to keep all of your tools in this toolbox because you might need, uh, need them at some point. Isn't it likely that um, Netanyahu is uh, um, just endorsing the two-state solution as a political move um, to take pressure off of um, what Obama really wants him to do, which is freeze the settlements, which he hasn't um, agreed on. And um, regarding the settlements, um, you said that 80% are on 5% of the land, but if you look at a map, um, it's, I mean, they look like they're spread like throughout the West Bank. And I mean, like I just that's going to cause such I feel like a problem in the two-state solution because um, they've like constricted like the freeways like mm -hmm. constrict um, uh, all the cities and and um, if if you guys have any uh, view Good. on that, right, let me deal with the second point first. Um, I I thought I was clear, but if it wasn't, I'll, I'll say it again. I'm talking about 80 percent of the settlers. I'm not talking about 80 percent of the settlements. Uh, where the remaining 20% of the settlers live are scattered, as you point out, all over the West Bank. And it is not viable to have a two-state solution for exactly the reasons you just said. Um, and so my view is, where does demography meet geography? Um, is that most of the settlers live in a few of the main ones. And that's where the focus should be by giving equal amount of land. You know, you could say every grain of sand if you want to take it to the nth degree. Um, uh, so no one could say that the, the settlers are there, you know, at their expense. Each side, Palestinians could say, we got 100% of the land. And Israel could say, uh, you know, we got 5%, uh, but that's where the 80% of the settlers live. So to me, uh, that is reasonable. And those, those small scattered settlements, which you're correct, they're all over the place, I don't think they're viable. And, uh, but, uh, so I think the solution has to reflect, you know, 
like I try to say in my remarks, that each side gets something big. Um, and, uh, and those would have to go. Now, your first point about Bibi's, uh, you know, how sincere is he about uh, the two-state solution? Look, he's, you know, he's a, he's a polit this is not so simple for him. I mean, where he's coming from. He was against the Palestinian state for much of his life. And uh, if you want to drill down, I don't want to bore you with Israeli politics, but um, a lot of the centrist elements of the Likud in 2005 left the party with Ariel Sharon, uh, Tzipi Livni, and Ehud Olmert. Tragically, Sharon had a stroke within 30 days. But the point was, was that a lot of some of the elements who remained behind were more ideological. Uh, and for Netanyahu to tell the remnant, uh, look, that's just it. The game's up. It's two states. Um, that's something that has not been just whispered to someone's ear. It's been said publicly in the speech at Bar Ilan University, and he's going to be held accountable to that. And the negotiations, that which Wraith and I are optimistic that will begin shortly, are going to be on that basis. So this isn't a, a PR gesture of a one-time thing. Uh, people are going to now hold him to that commitment. And uh, so I do see it as, as a momentous move. And, but, you know, the proof is in the pudding always. And, and we'll see the results. But that's why I'm so keen on de actually demarcating the two states, because I think that will be the proof that this, this, new, uh, this new arrangement really takes hold. I mean, I would, uh, first of all, you pronounce the name right. So that's good. Um, I don't particularly care. I mean, I, less to be, I tend to be less charitable in my reading of Netanyahu than David. But bottom line, I don't care why he did what he did. I care that he did it. He decided to accept the two-state solution. I mean, in the world of politics, be it domestic or international, you never do things uh, just because you want to do them, but often you're forced into them. And it doesn't matter as long as that sticks. And as David said, if he continues in the negotiations, that for me, that was worth it. On the issue of settlements, issue of settlements is two things. Settlements as an end game, uh, as a permanent status uh, issue. And in this one, I fully agree with David. It's 5%, it's even possibly less than that. And during the negotiations, whether it's in Camp David and in Taba and before and after that, it was always clear Israel is going to keep some of the settlements that do not uh, affect the contiguity of the Palestinian state and the viability of the Palestinian state. So many of the settlements in, that are dispersed will have to go. And the Palestinians will have to be compensated by land from Israel for the land that Israel uh, annexes for that. So Israel takes 5%, it gives 5% somewhere else. The other issue, though, that you mentioned is the issue of settlement freeze and what uh, Obama has been trying to do. For the Palestinians, the settlements is not, are not only an issue of the end game. It's an issue of lived daily life. And you mentioned some of the symptoms, uh, roads that dissect the West Bank and what have you. And there is, for you know, rightly or wrongly, there is a sense among Palestinians that settlements are intended to grab Palestinian land and uh, preempt a permanent status uh, agreement. So I think something has to be done on settlements. Some movement has to be done on curtailing settlement growth. However, I do not believe that this has to be a precondition for negotiations. I think it's a very ridiculous, uh, and I must say, it's the Palestinians who are taking this position, and I fully disagree with it. How can you refuse to negotiate until the settlements uh, are stopped? Who are you punishing by doing this? They're punishing themselves. Negotiations are not a gift for the Palestinians to give the Israelis or vice versa. We often see both sides uh, threatening to withhold negotiations. I don't see the logic in that. Ultimately, negotiations are in everyone's interest, and at the same time, parallel to that, I believe that we have to continue pushing for a freeze in settlements. To that, but no, no linkage and no conditionality. 